I'm not in that kind of business, so I'm not looking to become a broker for your interest in India. But uh, I, I would put my money into football, given where Malaysia is at and where I think India is going. Have I answered all the questions? There's one more. I think. Sure. No, I think you've actually answered the celebrity oh, part. Okay. Of the way. <laughs> I think uh, to conclude, if there's one thing that Malaysia can learn from India, what would that be? I can't answer that question because I must confess that I have not um, um, studied Malaysia enough. I don't know enough about the political economy of uh, Malaysia. And uh, I think that's, that's really sad because we're so close. We're five hours apart. And I feel actually very ashamed by the fact that such deep and probing questions were asked of me about India. And I wouldn't be able to ask the same questions about Malaysia. But I will say one thing, which is that um, I know that uh, pretty high-tech goods are produced in Malaysia. The bulk of them are produced under foreign brand names, under US brand names. And every major uh, tech manufacturer in the world has a manufacturing facility in Malaysia. This is something that the average Indian does not know. And the fact that they don't know it, but it is true, is something which I think Malaysia should capitalize on. And that could become a beachhead for the entry of Malaysia into India. So I don't know whether we can teach um, uh, Malaysia anything. I think we have a lot to learn from a country which has been growing at over 7% per annum for 20 years uh, and is now such an advanced nation compared to us. But this is the one thing that I would say, that Malaysia is not up front in the consciousness of financial and commercial players in India, whereas it has a lot to offer in terms of uh, goods, uh, technical expertise, and very clearly oil and gas, edible oils, where we already have trading relations, but there's no relations in terms of expertise, technology. So that is a bridge which I wish you would uh, walk over. All right, thank you very much for sharing your critical and honest thoughts about India with us. Uh, and with that, uh, I would like to pass the floor to the uh, chairperson. All right, thank you, Mr. Mohit. If you can remain on stage. I'm just going to try another language 101 today. Since my name, Suhana, means some form of beauty. And my whole family is big excuse fan of me, Bollywood. Excuse me. Excuse me here. Huh? Just now I raised a question. Why there are so many Indians come to Malaysia as a mama? You work in the mama shop, but our, our speaker never answered this question. I'm sorry. I'm extremely sorry. And uh, you should be I'm sorry too, because well, you're yes. supposed to remind me <laughs> as uh, the interlocutor. Uh, first of all, you have to realize that uh, there are so many Indians, full stop. Uh, <laughs> and um, if you travel in the US, do you know what motels are called in the US? They're called potels because uh, they're all owned by the Gujaratis, many of whom are Patels. And um, um, all the newspaper stores in London are owned by Indians. Um, but I think the, the, the historical reason for that is uh, um, very clear, twofold. One is that um, as the plantation sector grew in uh, Malaysia uh, between um, uh, three quarters of a century and one and a half century ago, there was a need for indentured labor, and a lot of that indentured labor came from India. And so you already had strong ties between India and Malaysia. And um, as a country which was clearly not growing rapidly enough, but whose economically, but whose population was growing, there was a need for outlets of that uh, population. And you find that in Singapore, in Malaysia, the entire Thaili, the entire Thai garment trade is controlled by Indians. So you have Indians everywhere, everywhere in the world. And it's not Malaysia in particular. Right? And also because I've kind of like missed out on that question, I'm going to say that, you know, people should be free to move and work wherever they go, provided that they're hardworking, they have every right to be there. All right. Well said. 
excellent summary. Mr. Mohit, Shukriya, Apkabat Kelye, Hambohut Abhariye. Okay. Okay, so now let me translate. She said, Thank you very much. We are uh, indebted to you for sparing your time. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, session three, we'll be talking about SCOMI's Mumbai monorail experience. SCOMI group are involved in mainly three core businesses, the oil field services, the public transportation, and marine services. We are delighted to invite the force behind SCOMI's success, Encik Shah Hakim, the CEO and the non-executive, non-independent executive director of SCOMI group. To moderate, let's invite Zia Mohzani from the Performance Management and Delivery Unit, Pemandu. Let's invite the speakers up to the stage. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. I hope you had a very, very good lunch. Um, okay, today here with me is uh, Encik Shah Hakim, who is uh, the CEO of SCOMI Group, Bahad. Um, Previously, we had a very interesting discussion on, you know, very much macro about China and India. Um, today here, we will talk about how can a Malaysian company come into India, how have they, have they started their operations in India, and you know, it's a very interesting, interesting actually, uh, venture into India. So, uh, Mr. Shah Hakim here will be telling you about the Mumbai monorail story. So, uh, if, if you could. Yep. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. <clears throat> um, first of all, um, I've got a short presentation and uh, the presentation really focuses on, on uh, a little bit of SCOMI, a bit of propaganda on what the company is, what we do. Um, apart from that, we'll uh, explain to you a little bit about how we as a company view the world. Uh, the priorities around the world, uh, the markets, why we choose certain markets and not operate in certain markets. And uh, finally, uh, we'll talk a little bit about India. I'm by no, I'm by no standards uh, an expert on India. Uh, we have some experience working in the India. We know some of the peculiarities in the market. And uh, I can uh, explain a little bit to you about what goes on in India. Uh, and after that, I'm quite open to uh, questions. I'm sure you all are, you have a lot of questions about things that go on in India. Okay. Uh, a little bit about a little bit about SCOMI. I think there's a few slides on SCOMI. Um, for those of you that are uh, not familiar with SCOMI. Uh, SCOMI actually means Subang Commercial Moto Industry. Uh, that's where the company started 15 years ago in Kampong Subang in an old shack and that we started as a uh, fabricator for coach for buses and, and so on. That's the, the origin of the company. So from there, we, we've then grown the business. Today we have three business lines. We are an oil field service company. We are a public transport manufacturer, and finally, we are also in the marine business. If you consolidate the turnover of the group, we are today maybe slightly, depending on the year, slightly more than uh, a billion US. Now, we operate in 28 countries. Uh, we have more than 4,000 employees, um, and uh, this really is a network of countries that's quite valuable, um, mainly in the oil field services. Now, a group vision, um, you know, we, companies, like every company, it's important to have a vision. We've come up with a vision of where we want to be in 2020, and we run on a three-year planning cycle. So 2011 ends the third planning cycle for us. We go into another three-year planning cycle that ends in 2014. So the whole idea, you know, it's very difficult to imagine that you will be this largest organization or the best organization in the world. But generally what you want to have is you want to have sh strong shareholder returns. You want to make sure that you continue to innovate. Okay? And when you continue to innovate, you stay relevant in the market. 
And finally, um, you want to have a, a, a good set of quality people. I forgot to mention in the earlier slide, we define ourselves as a global technology company. Okay? In that definition of a global technology company, and the word technology always comes out in everything we do, is the ownership of technology is very important. It is very difficult to go out into foreign markets and compete effectively if there is no hole in the technology. If you're purely a trader, if you're purely a service company, operating in a lot of the international markets can be a real challenge. This is how we view business. Okay? We view business quite simply. In, the, in, in every market, there is, of course, the market itself. Then there is the, the capability within an organization to address the market, and there's the competition in the market. In most instances, you find that companies operate in a very small segment of the market. Okay? And it's very difficult for companies to move and enlarge its market share. Our view of the world is to make sure that in every product line that we are involved in, we can have the lion's share of that market. Okay? And to have that lion's share of the market is only, again, possible when you own the technology and when you evolve the technology effectively. And also, when you look at developing a technology or a product, you look at developing the technology to serve the largest potential market there is in, 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 in the world. Okay? For us, when we develop, for example, the monorail product, we developed that monorail product with a view that we wanted to target India. Okay? India has or will have up to 200 cities, more than 200, uh, 2 million people, has 1.3 billion people, will go on to having maybe 2 billion people in the next 20, 30 years. So it's a huge market. So when we sat down and started developing the product strategy, or product development strategy, um, or the technology strategy, we looked at developing a product that would serve India. We believe if you could sell a product in India, you can almost sell that product anywhere in the world. Okay, that's the simple philosophy. So within the organization, the philosophy is always that if you cannot, you don't have a product or a, a, an offering that can allow you to capture a large part of that, that market that you're going into, it is best to slowly evolve out of that product. So this, this is the thinking behind our organization, within our organization. Now, as I, as I mentioned, and to do that, uh, as I mentioned, ownership of technology is very important. Uh, the financial strength of the organization is also very important. Going out internationally, uh, if you don't have a large balance sheet, if you don't have uh, uh, the ability, the network to raise funding, uh, it becomes a huge challenge. And, uh, and of course, most important to make everything work, you need to have a really motivated, a really en engaged bunch of uh, people that's willing to do this. Okay? It is very easy for, in, I, I give a simple example. In the business that we're in, for example, the building of monorails, today there are three companies in the world that build monorails, ourselves, Bombardier, and Hitachi. Okay? Um, and it is very easy for someone to walk into Bombardier and get a job and have a very comfortable job and build a product in Bombardier because Bombardier is very established. It has the right structures. But an engineer that works in SCOMI, whether it's a Malaysian, an Englishman, or an Australian, uh, they have a different level of engagement. Okay? They have a le le different level of engagement, and they ha have a different level of wanting to achieve. And because of that, they come up with very unique ideas on how to beat the competition. Things that we do within our engineering department are things that I believe a lot of the competition would not even consider or always has the mindset cannot be done. So having the right people in trying to develop technology is very, very important. Then of course, aside from having the right people, the product and the financial strength, you must make sure that you develop a product uh, that has demand in the market. 
there's no no point developing a product that has uh, no demand in the market. You also need to make sure that you develop a product that uh, there's growth in the market that will require the product. I hope my time is not out yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's only been two minutes. <laughs> So that's, that's the way we think about things and the way we, we, we evolve things and, 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 and look at how we want to stay competitive and stay relevant in, in, in markets. Our strategy always evolves around this chart. The first step is to make sure that we stay a low-cost, high-premium offering organization. A lot of these are, you know, people say, people may think these are textbook stuff. But when you, you have to really understand what it means. Being low cost and high premium is not as easy as it's set out in, in, in the chart. Okay? Driving an organization to remain uh, cost competitive, high level of productivity takes a lot of effort. Okay? And especially one that operates in multi markets is not as simple as one that operates in a single market single market, like for example, in Malaysia or in Thailand or in Indonesia. And of course, as always, offering good quality product is very, very important. I, I, I don't think people really understand the, the meaning of offering a good quality product. And, and, and to offer a good quality product, there is a need to continuously innovate. And again, owning the technology allows you to innovate. Yeah? So low cost, high premium, quite simply, make sure your cost structures are clear, make sure your productivity stays high. And for us, we go through a planning cycle. We do certain things in a year, we do certain other things in the following year to make sure we stay low cost and uh, offer a good premium product. We then continually uh, drive uh, technology development. Uh, in the oil and gas side, for example, 12 years ago, we were agents for third party product. Um, today, um, today, um, we have our own products. We develop a lot of oil field uh, products that sit on rigs, which we sell around the world. We have our own water treatment systems that are operating around the world, drilling fluid systems. So if you look at something that's offered on a rig, if you, if you imagine what a Slumberger, a Halliburton, or a Baker would offer, uh, we do the green stuff. We are about to start doing the, the blue stuff. And maybe in the future, we'll do the red stuff. So we, we are moving up that chain to be more and more competitive around the world and offer a lot more services that can compete head on with the, the big three all service, all service companies. On the public transport side, we started by building buses. In 1999, we, we, we do wagons. Then we evolved into building uh, monorail trains, a two-car train. That evolved into building a four-car train. And this is the four car that we're selling to, to Mumbai, we are selling to Brazil. There's two projects in Brazil, maybe there'll be a third one soon. And of course, the next step is to make sure that we develop a metro train, which is in progress. So ownership, and, and, uh, ownership of that technology and the knowledge that you, you have by building products along the way allows you to move the next level and the next level. Yeah? This, for example, is... Um, one of the trains that we, de we delivered to Mumbai, which is sitting in the Mumbai um, uh, depot right now. Okay. This is our uh, facility in, uh, in Rawang. We call it North KL, but it's Rawang. Uh, uh, it sounds a bit more glamorous. You know? uh, that is an actual train on an actual test track. That is not a, a photoshopped picture. The global outlook, how do we view the world? Okay. I guess I don't have to tell you about what's going on in the US, what's going on in Europe. Um, there's obviously a lot of turmoil in these countries. And the turmoil that you find in these countries actually offer huge opportunities for Asian organizations to grow and to, to, to acquire new technology and so on. So the global so slowdown is good for us. Okay. That's the first thing that we have to, to, to acknowledge. Now. With the global slowdown, these, these are the things that you will see happen. Commodity prices will start uh, coming down. 
then demand for alternative energy sources will start increasing. Uh, cheaper sources of, you know, in, in the past, I'm not talking about alternative as in solar panels and so on and so forth, right? As the, there are new so and cheaper sources of gas, for example. Today, there is shale gas. Shale gas in the last five years in the U.S. has gone from a 2% share of the U.S. energy market to a 30% share of the energy market in the U.S. It will do the same thing in China. So new discoveries of e energy sources is going to change the way energy is consumed. Okay? In the past, there was this, I'm, I'm, as you all may very well know, today the world consumes 86 million barrels of oil a day. Okay? And the forecast was by 2020, it will exceed 100 billion oil, barrels of oil a day. At the rate alternatives and new sources of energy is being found, uh, it is very unlikely that we'll reach 100 million by 2020. Okay? So the utilization of oil will slow down. Uh, you also notice today there are a lot more new technology where cars uh, uh, consume less petrol per 100 kilometers that it runs. So these sort of things will reduce the consumption of energy plus the demand dropping will continue to put, prices, uh, uh, put, to put pressure on commodity prices. The BRIC nations will continue to grow. Uh, I'm not sure when was the last time you guys vid visited China, India, Brazil, or, or, or Indonesia, but if you look at what's happening in those countries, based on the population size and the demand in that market, um, you know, it, it is just quite amazing. And the BRIC countries will continue over to grow at a very, very fast, fast rate over the next 20 years. Beyond, this is of course our view of the world, yeah? not necessarily what you find in textbooks. Beyond BRIC nations, there are, we believe there are three other nations uh, that we call the second phase BRIC. Number one is Turkey. Turkey is the country that uh, is the center of growth for Caspian and North Africa. Okay, and Ca Turkey is is a very robust economy today that will propel and support the growth of that region. Number two is South Africa. South Africa will more and more be the gateway to Central and South Africa. Uh, it's a very dominant market today and, and very stable. And number three is Indonesia. Indonesia uh, is an amazing market. It's a market that we all cannot ignore. And it's a market that will continue to grow at a very fast rate. Today, Indonesia is growing at 7% despite of its government. So, but when, can you imagine the level of growth Indonesia would go through <clears throat> when its government gets its act together? So Indonesia is a big market and one that will grow very fast over the next 20 years. <clears throat> so the scenario is large economies will slow down, uh, slower demand, and uh, prices for coal and, and oil will continue to drop. US dollar will uh, come back to become the dominant currency, the strong currency of the world. Uh, interest rates will remain low. And for us as a company, the main focus markets will be Brazil, India, Malaysia, and, and, and Indonesia. Um, India. Uh, I'm by, like I say, and I would like to qualify this again, I'm by no, by no, uh, by no standard, apparently you had a speaker today uh, from India, I'm by no uh, uh, an expert, no standards, an expert of India, we right? spent four or five years in India, um, but every time I get to India, of course they welcome me quite well, I get shown to go to the uh, local line at immigration. <laughs> Uh, which is quite embarrassing. Uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, when you look at the market, you know, there is this huge romance and excitement when you look at India. It's, it's, uh, it's this huge market, there's a billion odd people, robust economy, a lot of things happening, dynamic, and when you talk to local Indian businessmen, Indian businessmen are very, very intelligent people. You know, you can name today, I, if I ask the, 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 the audience today, you can, if I name, ask you about the top Indian banker or the top Indian business family, you can name these names, right? But it's funny, 
when you talk about China and I ask you, name me a top Chinese manager. Can you name one? You never heard of a top Chinese manager. You've never heard of a top Chinese banker. So what it means is that it's not just India is vibrant because of its large economy and its, and its population size. It's also vibrant because of the depth of the talent pool in India. Okay? The depth of the talent pool in India is quite amazing. Okay? So as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur looking at India, is great. But as an entrepreneur sitting in India after four years of doing business in India, you sort of have mixed feelings about, you know, whether you really want to be in this market, you know. It's one of those feelings like, you know, you know if you have a brand new Ferrari, of course the NASA boys would know this, brand new Ferrari, and you see your mother-in-law driving off the cliff with it. <laughs> it's one of those feelings, you know. And, and uh, of course, I never have that feeling, you know. I don't have a Ferrari, neither do, but I, and I love my mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> but in India is amazing market, it's just amazing. This is what the numbers in India look like, okay. Um, you've got 590 million people living in cities. That's double the US population. Okay, that's a big number, right? Then you've got, over the next 20 years, they are going to build 7,400 kilometers of metro subways and monorails and so on. Can you imagine how excited that makes me feel? Right? They're going to build, uh, Krishnan Tan would like this, they're going to build 2.5 billion square meters of roads in India, highways. Okay? That apparently, according to the minister, they want to build 20 kilometers of roads a day for the next 50 years. Something like that, some huge number like that. Um, there will be, uh, in the next uh, five years, 68 cities of more than one million people. In fact, once I sat with a politician and asked him, what is your goal for India? He said three things. Number one is education for everyone, um, um, education for everyone, uh, healthcare for everyone, and they want to build 203 million population cities. Okay, and, and when I thought about it, that will, that's only 600 million people. What happens to the balance 800 million? The numbers are just staggering, right? It's just absolutely unbelievable. Then, of course, um, you've got numbers like um, uh, 900 million square meters of commercial and residential space. You know, you're looking at, you know, 1,800 pavilions that needs to be built over the next 20 years. These are just big, big numbers. So for all of you inspiring entrepreneurs in the, in the room, pack your bags. <laughs> this is where you should be. And this is the city of dreams. You have the Mukesh Ambani house. I don't, I don't know whether you...